Happy Sabbath, everyone. Are you happy to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. Today is a very special and high Sabbath. We have uh, getting baptized today, Mario Pasquale and uh, our sister Yolanda Edsidi. And uh, we have a family who came here all the way from Mexico to have their young one dedicated today. That's Naeem and Christine De La Cruz. And uh, the grandson, or the son named Joel, is actually the grandson of Winona and Dennis Toro. So we are very, very happy and blessed to have uh, this event. And we'd like to extend a very special welcome to the guests and visitors who are with us today. We have a number of announcements before uh, we begin our worship service. Uh, the first is an inbound transfer uh, for Charlie Ramirez. He is transferring to Waipahu Church from the High Desert Bilingual SDA Church in Hesperia, California. So this is, amen, Charlie's been with us for a while and we uh, are finally going to get to um, have him as an official member. Uh, this is the first reading and the next reading and vote will be next Sabbath. Also tomorrow we have our food bank distribution and that is a time when we uh, gather to distribute uh, groceries to those in our community who are less fortunate. They do come onto our campus to receive spiritual food and we minister to them. So if any church members would like to come and support that, we invite you to come at 2 p.m. Uh, tomorrow here at the church and our speaker for uh, the spiritual food time is Christian Mascrinas. At this time, I'd like to call upon Justin Wells to tell us about uh, this exciting new adventure club that's uh, starting up here at Waipahu very soon. Justin. Happy Sabbath, Church. So in uh, January, the adventure club will no longer be under the Pathfinders. So um, the adventure club staff has been um, planning for this upcoming event and uh, we're planning on doing a registration day next week Sabbath after church um, just to give you information about what the club is about and what we're planning on doing for this coming year and uh, so I just want to invite parents that are maybe interested in having their um, kids come and join our club or if you're just interested in what we're about and I also want to encourage the um, parents that already bring their kids to the meetings it's um, good information about what we're going to be doing and different things that, you know, the different changes that are going to be taking a place. So it's going to be uh, next Sabbath after church. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Um, just some more announcements. The first is uh, this afternoon we are going to have a uh, sermon discussion time. Our sermon this morning is going to be uh, called Soul Search, Getting to the Spiritual Roots of Emotional Dysfunction. It is a very, very deep, and I'm talking deep, topic. And uh, we're going to cover a lot of information. And so we would like to give the, uh, everyone here an opportunity to interact on the subject. So this afternoon at 2 p.m., we're going to have an open forum discussion session in which we will review the concepts that we cover, as well as allow everyone to ask questions or make comments or share testimonies. I will speak a little bit more about that right before the sermon, but that's at 2 o'clock today. And then at 6.30 p.m., we have a very special uh, gym night. It's actually a church social and sports night at the Hawaiian Mission Academy Gym. So tonight we have the gym all to ourselves. There's going to be a wonderful um, food. Uh, it is potluck style, so we invite you to bring a vegetarian dish to share. Uh, we are gathering at the same time to celebrate the recent wedding of Dexy and Carlton. And uh, after that, we're going to eat, share, talk story, and then play, play, play. Families who play together, stay together. There'll be basketball, volleyball, and uh, everything in between. So we invite you to come out tonight at 6.30 p.m. Uh, to uh, join us. And for those of us who are setting up for this event, we ask that you be there at 6 o'clock as soon as the sun goes down to set up. Uh, as for everyone else, join us at 6.30 this evening. Amen? Amen. 
next is a year-end event that we are glad to announce. For the second year in a row, Waipahu and YNI churches are getting together for a year-end camp meeting. That's going to be December 8th to the 10th. That's a Friday to Sunday at Camp YNI. Now, our guest speaker for this event is going to be someone from Amazing Facts Ministry, Pastor Dennis Preeby. He was with Amazing Facts for 30 years. Very experienced evangelist, a man of God, full of knowledge, and he's bringing his son and daughter-in-law, Matthew and Dennis, or Delise, Delise Preeby, who are naturalists who specialize in seeing creation through the eyes of the Bible. We're going to have a wonderful time, and uh, both churches are going to be closed on Sabbath, December 9, in order for everyone to attend. Now, this event is by registration, which means everybody here uh, needs to fill out a registration form, even if you're just attending for the Sabbath. Now, today we want to distribute those registration forms, and if I could ask the deacons to now pick up those forms, if you are not a member of our church, now raise your hand if you are the head of family, because it's one registration sheet per family. So please raise your hand, okay? If you are not a member of Waipahu or Waianai Church, you can still come, but you have to register as a guest. We have a separate guest registration form. So if you would like to come as a guest, please raise your hand and ask the deacon for a guest form. Members, please fill out the paper that says member registration form. Okay, the reason why we're having everyone register in advance is so that we can make proper preparations. Uh, we do have lots of good food that will be served that weekend, and we need to make sure that we cook enough, and uh, we need to uh, know ahead of time, in terms of seating capacity, how much we will need to prepare. So um, if you are uh, head of family, please raise your hand. If uh, you are going on your own, raise your hand and fill out a form uh, for yourself. Any guests, please fill that out uh, so that you can join us. The registration deadline is September 3rd, but we ask that everyone not do the last minute rush. It has been experienced that uh, everyone waits until the 11th hour, but of course, especially when you're preparing for the second coming of Jesus, you don't want to do that, right? Amen. Yes, question. Um, it's not September 3rd, it's December 3rd. Did I say September? Yeah. Okay, great. I was just seeing if you were paying attention. <laughs> it is December 3, thank you. Yes. So um, if there's anyone else, please raise your hand. Let the deacons give you your form. These forms will be available between now and December 3rd, but we ask that you register as soon as possible. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, we'll give you another minute to receive the form. Um, if you, when you do fill out the form, please submit it to Michelle DeSoto. Michelle, could you please stand? Okay, so when you are done finished, if you're finished with your form, please submit it to the uh, lovely young lady who is standing, and she will process the forms and get everything ready. All right. Having said all of that, the rest of the announcements are printed in your bulletin, and I would like to go on to read our call to worship today, which is found in the book of Psalms. Psalms chapter 34, verses 1 to 3. Psalms chapter 34, verses 1 to 3. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. O magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. May the Lord bless us as we seek him this morning.
please stand as we uh, have the intro. <laughs> While we have the hymn of praise, uh, number 108, Amazing Grace. And I know you know this song, so I know you can sing it out nice and loud. We'll sing the first, the third, and the fifth verses. just a few moments, Brother Mario and Sister Yolanda will enter the waters of baptism. But before they do that, they would like to take the next few moments to share their testimony with their church family. They would like to show and say how the Lord has led them to this point. We are so happy for the Pascual family who is here today and all the friends and family of Yolanda. And today, they, Mario has told me he's nervous, but I said, no, brother, 
Lord's going to do great things. You're going to do just fine. God is going to speak through you and bless us, and he has quite a story, as well as Yolanda. So at this time, I'd like to call to our rostrum here, Brother Mario Pasquale. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Uh, I'd like to introduce my, my friend that came to see my baptismal, Brother Matt, from high school. Please step up. <laughs> and then Uncle Curtis from Big Island. And Lopez, uh, he was stationed in Alaska together. Army. Thank you for coming. So uh, my testimony, um, before I knew God, I was atheist, and I didn't believe no God. Um, me and Matt was at a church at one time, and, and uh, boy, we was in a, in a group, and when it came to me, I told everyone, I don't believe no God. And I even told my family too, it broke their heart. So we had a heated argument about it. Um, and also, um, you know, I came, committed a lot of fornication, um, drinking a lot, involving the world, just seeking for pleasure. And I joined the army, and that made things worse for me. Um, until I got injured, Things started to change my life, and I was desperate for help. And my sister invited me to go to uh, Big Island to hear Todd's sermon. And the night before that, I told my sister I won't be able to make it. And I was thinking in my head, like, oh, you know, I've been to a lot of churches, and I don't want to go to church. And um, so my sister told her friend that, you know, I wouldn't be able to make it because of my injury. Uh, and then her friend was like, oh, you know, I know someone who could fix Mario. Uh, he fixed my husband's arm. It was like literally paralyzed, you know, right shoulder, frozen shoulder. And my sister told me about it and I was like, oh, wow, this is amazing. Maybe I should go there for that reason and not go to church. <laughs> uh, but so on the, I decided to go to see the church. And on the road, my sister was like, uh, you know, this sermon is going to be really deep. Um, you're not going to understand. You're going to be really scared. And you're not going to come back to church. And I was thinking, you know, I don't believe in God, so why should I care about it? What is she talking about? <laughs> so, um, when I got to the church, uh, Taj was the speaker, and he uh, really reached out to me, and it was really deep that I had in mind a long time ago, and he used the Bible to, uh, these God's words to reach out to because it was the truth and it was enlightening. So after also many times going to the church, it was hard for me to believe uh, there was a God out there. Um, but later I witnessed my sister's baptismal. Uh, it was really influential and it really uh, showed a lot how I changed my sister. And uh, after that, I started doing Bible studies, and you know, it came to that part where I wanted to do Bible studies every day. Uh, I was doing Bible studies with Christian, Mark, uh, and our sister in Big Island, Jess. So I would have big uh, Bible studies during the day, either with Mark or Christian, and then. Bible studies with Jess at night because I was so amazed how the Bible was speaking to me. It was the truth. 
And, you know, I started, um, when I met God, I stopped drinking, became vegan. <coughs> Trying to be vegan, actually, is hard. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and trying to spread the gospel um, in school, through friends, and, um, yeah. Um, but I have a message, you know, sometimes the trials in life is God's way of saving us. So, for my reason, it was my back, so it was really, um, it was for me to seek help, and God reached out to me because of my back. And also, I want to say, I, we're so blessed to be part of this SDA church. I truly believe that the truth will set you free, because the truth set me free. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. Sister Yolanda. Happy Sabbath, Church. I was a little nervous getting up here. Um, funny thing is, uh, this morning I wrote my testimony. Initially, I wrote it a week ago, and I went walking this morning and prayed. And for some reason, I guess God wanted me to change it. So. I grew up in the church and I also grew up uh, at a Seventh-day Adventist boarding school. When I was about 11 or 12, I decided to get baptized. And back then, I couldn't imagine living my life without God. And by high school, I transferred to a public school and um, a few things had happened in my life where I stopped trusting God and I started separating myself from Him by college. I decided to live my own life. I thought I didn't need God, and I started living for the world. I started going to parties, drinking, and everything. And through through all of that, God was always by my side because even in school, after all the parties and being out late and everything else, I still managed to graduate on the dean's honor list when I did graduate. And in 2006, I decided to join the Navy. And my life was still, I was still looking for the world. I was still going out, but it, went, it, would, it was twice as much because every weekend we would, you know, work hard, party hardier was our, was our motto. So basically, that was all, all we did. And I guess God was still with me as well because I was excelling in my personal life. I was advancing and everything else, but my personal life was a mess. Um, I got into trouble a couple of times, but that still didn't stop me. And I always had people around me, and I, even with all those people, I felt so alone. And in 2012, I guess I just couldn't live that life that, that I was living. I felt so broken, alone, and everything that I something in me it just I just fell down and knelt and prayed with all I with all I had. I even started crying when I was praying because I couldn't live the life that I was living. Because prior to that I even contemplated on taking my own life. And so I just started crying and praying. And I was in Italy at the time and there was I couldn't find a church but I was still praying and I was still reading the Bible and everything, and I transferred here to Hawaii, and so I was like, okay, I'm going to find a church that's close to me. So I went to Google, found a church, and, well, Google actually took me across the street to the, I guess, the old Samoan Seventh-day Adventist church, <laughs> and I drove around a little bit, couldn't find it, and I was like, well, I guess I'll just continue to read the Bible and everything and try to hopefully something will happen and somehow the pastor Eric's email actually popped up and so I sent him an email and 
he gave me the correct address and everything, and I came the next Sabbath that I got his email, and since then, my life has been, felt, it feels like I'm on the right track. Um, I'm a lot happier, and I don't feel alone. I feel I have God with me, and I don't hang out with anybody that I used to. All the encouragement is positive and not in a negative way. And oh, just by the way, I checked Google as well recently, and it's actually the correct address now. <laughs> and but um, I thank Bob Mark for last week's sermon because. Although he didn't realize it, I mean, it spoke to me, and he, he, one of his points was, despite our, despite our past, God still chooses us. So I felt like I had, um, I felt like I had forsaken God completely, and God wouldn't have left me. I even laughed saying that I think the church, like, I would burn if I walked to the church, but <laughs> apparently I didn't, and I'm here standing in front of him. I want to thank each and every one of you for being here to share this decision that I decided to make. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Yolanda. Just a few moments, we're going to witness both of them get baptized. And uh, before they do that, I just want to explain what you're about to see. Baptism is a, an outward symbol of uniting your life with Christ. We're going to go behind the screen here into a little baptistry, and we're going to immerse both of them under the water. You will see me raise my hand, and I will say, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. At that time, both Mario and Yolanda are symbolically going to the cross and being crucified with Jesus. As they enter the water, they are symbolically entering the tomb with Jesus. And when they come out of the water, they are symbolically uniting with Jesus in his resurrection. Amen? Amen. It's a beautiful ceremony. It's not just symbolizing death, burial, and resurrection, but the Bible also tells us that baptism is a wedding. In Romans chapter 7, it says, that you may be married to him who was raised from the dead. Who is the him here? Jesus. So baptismal vows, which we are about to do right now, are the equivalent of marriage vows. It is when we take our stand and formally say vows of fidelity to our, no, to our new spouse, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? So at this time, I would like to invite both our candidates to please take their place here at the center of the stage. I'm going to read the vows, and when you, if you are in agreement with each one after I read it, please raise your right hand and just like in a wedding, say, I do. I, Mario and Yolanda, believe there is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a unity of three co-equal persons. Amen. I accept the death of Jesus Christ on Calvary as the atoning sacrifice for my sins and believe that through faith in his shed blood, I am saved from sin and its penalty. Amen. I accept by faith the righteousness of Christ, my intercessor in the heavenly sanctuary, and accept his promise of transforming grace and power to live a loving, Christ-centered life here at home and before the world from this moment on. I believe the Bible is God's inspired word, the only rule of faith and practice for the Christian. I covenant to spend time regularly in prayer and Bible study. Amen. I accept the Ten Commandments as a transcript of God's character and a revelation of His will. It is my purpose by the power of the indwelling Spirit to keep this law, including the Fourth Commandment, which requires the observance of the seventh day of the week as the Sabbath of the Lord and the memorial of creation. Amen. I look forward to the soon coming of Jesus and the blessed hope when this mortal shall put on immortality. As I prepare to meet the Lord, I will witness to his loving salvation and by life and word help others to be ready for his soon return. Amen. 
I accept the biblical teaching of spiritual gifts and believe that the gift of prophecy is one of the identifying marks of the last day remnant church. I believe in church organization and it is my purpose to support the church by my tithes and offerings and by my personal effort and influence. I believe the body, that my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and I will honor God by caring for it, avoiding the use of that which is harmful, abstaining from all unclean foods, alcoholic beverages, tobacco, narcotics, and other harmful substances. I accept the New Testament teaching of baptism by immersion and desire to be so baptized as a public expression of faith in Christ and his forgiveness of my sins. And last, I accept and believe that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the remnant church of Bible prophecy and that people of every nation, race, and language are invited and accepted into its fellowship. Today, I so desire to be a member of this Waipahu local congregation of the World Church. Amen. 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 Church family, you have witnessed our candidates take their oath, and now I turn to you. Is there a motion now that we accept both Yolanda and Mario into the official membership of the Waipahu Seventh-day Adventist Church? Amen. Is there a second? All in favor say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. <clears throat> Welcome to your church family. Amen. And so at this time, before we enter the baptistry, we're going to have a special prayer of dedication upon both of you. So at this time, I'd like to ask the church elders to please join us here on this, this stage as we kneel. And for those who can kneel, we invite you to kneel where you are as we pray. Our dear, gracious, loving Heavenly Father, oh, all heaven is rejoicing for now, for before they were lost, but today Mario and Yolanda are found. And so today we rejoice with all heaven. But Lord, we thank you most of all for your gift of grace. We thank you, Lord, for coming after both of them and bringing them into your fold. And today, the day of their wedding to you, we ask now, Lord, that you wash away all their sinful past, that you remove all sin and unrighteousness from their life, and that you fill them anew with life in your spirit, fill them in a way that you've never filled them before. May you abide with them, may you walk with them daily, may you talk with them, and from this point forward, may you lead them to grow in grace, to draw stronger and closer to you until the day of your return. And so this morning, Lord, we ask that you ordain them now into the priesthood of all believers, that they also may be ambassadors of Christ, to go and spread the good news of salvation that they themselves are experiencing. May they share this message that they may seek and save the lost together with you and be co-laborers in the work of salvation. And today, Lord, we welcome them into the membership of your body, for the body of Christ is the church. And we ask now, Lord, that you endow upon them spiritual gifts to serve you and to do according to your will. May you empower them, may you strengthen them, and may, they fill, may you fill them in extra measure with your spirit from this day forward. We thank you for all you've done in their life, and we thank you for what you will do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 <clears throat> so at this time, the screen will come up, and we will proceed into the baptistry.
as you have decided to give your life to Him entirely, I, as a minister of the gospel, now baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Um, we're kind of nervous right now. <laughs> so, I'm usually used to preaching a sermon, but not singing. But I was asked by Ethel to help her out with this song. And so we're going to sing a song called uh, Born Again. And um, this is dedicated to our newly baptized members. Congratulations. Uh, and so please listen to the words, and the words will be on the screen. But now we got both of them at once. Today's offering, uh, 
that we're going to pick up today is for the local church budget. So this is what keeps our lights on, what keeps the air conditioning going, and the fans blowing. Everyone appreciate that? Amen. Yes. So um, we just wanted to remember that as we as we move forward. We have different offerings at different salvists, and of course, uh, from time to time, we do have the local church offering, and that's what this is for, to keep the local church going. And this local church, I, I, I have to tell you, this place is full today, right? A few, few more seats available here in the middle and a couple here and there, but otherwise, uh, we got a pretty full house today. And I've noticed that this church has been alive. And this church is alive because God is present here. And, uh, you know, we're, we're here in this place because God expects us to be a light to others around us. And um, that's part of and not just keeping the lights on, but having a place to be able to come to worship and to be able to fellowship together. That's what this is about. So as we give this morning, give knowing that this is going towards helping us continue to move forward with our mission. And God will bless us forever uh, and for giving up a, only a little bit of what he has back. If you have tithes and other offerings, if you want it to go to a, a specific place, please write, mark that down on an envelope so that we'll make sure it goes to the appropriate place that you want it to go to. And may the deacons please uh, take the offering up at this time. <laughs>
Father in heaven, I thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day. And I thank you for all who are here and all who have given from their hearts. Lord, do we, we come before you in, in solitude and honor and in, in praise of what, who you are and what you've done. But Lord, we also know that you give responsibilities to us of what we should do to each other. Lord, help us to fulfill that need as well. But we ask that every dollar and every penny given be used and magnified to bring others to you. So Lord, for Lord, that is our mission and that is our goal. And help us, Lord, to be ready to meet you again in the clouds of heaven. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, I'd like to call forward the Dela Cruz family, and uh, we have brother Naim and sister Christine, and their baby Joel. Joel. They uh, are Christine is the daughter of Winona Toro, and uh, Daniel Toro is his sister, and I understand that Grandma and Grandpa and the whole family would like to join us here on the stage. So at this time, I'd like to invite all of you to come and uh, join us. Now, Joel is, um, he was born on this very date one year ago. So today is his very first birthday. Amen? Amen. And it's also the day of his dedication. So as they say in Mexico, Feliz cumpleaños. Happy birthday. So would the family come join us here? Announcement. Uh, well, the person who owns the car with license plate number uh, TC4750 and another vehicle DN256. If you can move your vehicle, someone needs to leave at this time. Wow, it's a bigger family than I thought. <laughs> Maybe if we could move in a little bit more. Now, um, a child dedication is not just a dedication of the child, it's also a dedication of the parents and the entire family. Now, um, we see in the Bible that God has gifted us with children, they're a special gift from God, and we see examples in the Bible of children being dedicated, most specifically Hannah, when she prayed for her son, and God gave her a son, she brought him to the temple to be dedicated today. We do not practice infant baptism, rather, we practice the dedication of young ones to the Lord until the, the age in which they can decide to be baptized for themselves. Amen? If I could ask the AV people just to turn me up a little bit more. Thank you. In Matthew chapter 19 it says, or Jesus says, Let the little children come to me. And do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Then little children were brought to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. And that's what we will do momentarily. But before that, I would like to first speak to the family before we dedicate the young one. Now, as you all know, being a parent is a big responsibility. You have entrusted to you a very precious life. And in Ephesians 6, 4, the Lord says... Bring your children up in the training and instruction of the Lord. But in order for that to happen, the family must first understand and follow the truth that God has for us. Now we have to understand that the child's first initial understanding of God will come from you. 
And so therefore, you must understand what God is like to us, so you can be that way to little Joel. First, we have to understand that we have a loving Father, a Father in Heaven who shows us kindness and mercy. And so you must be that way to this young little one. I know, looking at his cute little face, you have no trouble at all being kind to him. But our Father is not only kind to us, He is also our righteous judge. He's the one who disciplines us and corrects us and shows us what is correct, even though we may feel otherwise. So you must be that way to your young one. You must show him what is correct. You must discipline him what necessary. But you must do it in such a way that it leads him to do what is right instead of leading him to rebel. Not only must you be a loving parent, loving parents, righteous judges, but you all also must be protectors. This little one is very vulnerable. He's very helpless. May you provide that hedge of protection around him. Provide a safe environment for him to grow up in. And please be reminded that the devil is out to destroy the family. And you must make sure that you are in Christ so that Christ could put a hedge of protection over your family so that this little one can be protected from the attacks of the enemy. We have assaults going on all throughout. And there are influences coming in through the television, through music, through all other venues, which will seek to corrupt your home. May you put a hedge of protection, protect this little one from those influences. More than that, as God is our teacher, may you be His teachers. Teach Him how to use His will correctly, how to choose right from wrong, and most especially, to choose Jesus as His Savior. These are heavy responsibilities, but they are the duties of the parents and the family. How you portray God to this little one will have consequences not just for this life, but for all of eternity. So, having said those heavy things, I do ask now, do you as parents and family of Joel Ikaya de la Cruz so take this charge to raise him up in the fear of the Lord, and to show him the example that has been set before you by Jesus. If you so accept, please raise your right hand and say, I do. Amen. 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 Brothers and sisters, you have witnessed our family take their oath. And now I turn to you. Do you, church, accept your responsibility and charge to support this family with prayer? Because it takes a village to raise a church. Amen? Amen. If you so accept, please raise your right hand and say, I do. I do. At this time, I will do my best to hold little Joel in my hands. And then we will ask the elders to come up and join us where you can and to lay hands upon the parents as we pray. And we invite everyone, if you can kneel, to kneel where you are. Our dear, gracious, loving Heavenly Father, this morning, Lord, I uplift little Joel to you. Lord, he is a precious soul. He's a gift from you. And now this morning, Lord, as we gather as friends and church family, we ask that your Holy Spirit be upon him now. Keep him, Lord, in the palm of your hand until that day that he chooses you as his Savior. Between now and then, may you be with the family, and may you just bless and guide him. And may you walk with him and provide him that hedge of protection with your holy angels around him. Again, Lord, we ask for your blessing upon him now. And we dedicate him to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I had to keep that short. <laughs> okay. Congratulations. And we have a certificate for you. here that says 
Joel Kaya de la Cruz was dedicated to the Lord at the Waipahu Seventh-day Adventist Church on the 18th day of November, year of our Lord, 2017. May the Lord bless you as you continue to raise him up in the fear of the Lord. Have you been blessed so far? Amen. Amen. The two things we did this morning are one of the two things that I enjoy very much about my job. It's a lot of fun, especially when you're glorifying the Lord. So we thank all who participated. And today we'll begin our message. And um, as all of you know, uh, we have a ministry called Healing Rain that uh, was here recently, and uh, it centered upon emotional healing. And so I wanted to continue this theme of emotional healing throughout this quarter here at our church. So today our sermon is called Soul Search, Getting to the Spiritual Roots of Emotional Dysfunction. This is a very, very deep topic. What's dysfunction? Anyone, uh, anybody want to venture a guess? What is dysfunction? Something not working right. Something not working right. It's not functioning. So, there is an issue within all human beings in which in one way or another we are dysfunctional. We are not functioning emotionally the way God intended us to. And today we're going to look at the root problem that infects us all. And then later on, uh, we're going to have a second sermon that is called Soul Healing, Getting to the Spiritual Heart of Emotional Wholeness. So today we're looking at the problem because your solution to the problem will be proportionate to your understanding of the problem. Are you with me? So the second sermon, Soul Healing, will be on December 2nd. What date? December 2nd. Do not miss it. Write it on your calendar now. If you're here today, you need to be here for the second part. Amen? I don't want to give you the problem and then not give you the solution. That is like a total doubt, okay? But we have to take it in parts because there is so much. Now, because today is very deep, and there's a lot of information that's going to be covered, we, um, I want to give everyone the chance to reflect upon it and to come back in the afternoon to discuss it. In the afternoon, it's going to be sort of an open forum discussion where if there are things that you would like me to review, I will do that. If there are testimonies you want to share regarding things you hear, please come and do that. At any rate, I'd like to invite everybody back here at what time? Two o'clock to partake of this sermon discussion. Now, I want to begin with a verse in the Bible. Psalms chapter 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Today we are imploring the Lord to search our hearts, search us, reveal to us what is in the mind and what is in the heart. It is an invitation to introspection. Introspection is when we look and see what is it that is happening within us. And you know something, when we engage in introspection today, we will come to three conclusions. These conclusions are simple. Everybody's got problems. Everybody's got issues. And everybody is broken. Can you say amen? 
You see, everybody's got problems, issues, and everyone's broken. And you know, Carl had his issues. You see, Carl has, he, he grew up with a father and an older brother. But he knew nothing of his mother. Where was his mother? We don't know. Did she run out on the family? Did she die? We don't know. He did not have a mother at home. Carl was a rebellious teen. He grew up and, well, if he had no mother to nurture me, why should I care about anybody else? He became rebellious and as a teen, he ditched school and he left, he left home at an early age. And then he went out on the street and did Mr. Tough Guy, Mr. Bad Boy stint. He lived it up, drinking, fighting, getting into the whole sex, drugs, and rock and roll kind of thing. He couldn't seem to hold a good job or have a steady relationship. He was what you would call the epitome of messed up. He had no direction in life. But deep down beside all of that, deep down underneath, he was seeking something deeper. He was seeking and longing for a deeper happiness and a deeper fulfillment. See, my friends, I need to make a confession here. Carl is not his real name. You know him better as the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. You see, everybody's got problems. Everybody's got issues. Everybody's broken. See, Lisa had her issues. Lisa went through five failed marriages. And now she's on guy number six. And they're not married. They're living together. You see, we don't know much about her family background. But judging from her interaction with men, we can surmise that it's possible that she either had a bad or absent father figure in her life. And somehow, possibly, there could have been sexual abuse by a male perpetrator. We don't know. But we do know that she was somewhat religious. She kind of knew about God, but not really. And she was very physically attractive, but yet very emotionally insecure. Despite all of that, she was confused and conflicted about herself, her life, and her future. Deep down in her heart, she was thirsty. She was thirsting for something deeper, thirsting for a deeper happiness, thirsting for living water. I have a confession to make. Her real name is not Lisa. You know her better as the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4. You see, everybody's got problems. Everybody has issues. Everybody's broken. The Nahoku family, Nahoku family, had their issues. You see, the Nahoku family was a big local family with 13 kids. 13 kids. 12 boys and one girl. All by the same father, but by different mothers. And you see, this whole family was third and fourth generation church members. In fact, their grandfather was a church pioneer and founder. But these families, unfortunately, from the grandfather down, were very dysfunctional. And you see that dysfunction passed down generation to generation. And what you find is, in this particular family, the parents paid, played favorites. And the, uh, the siblings, the brothers and sisters, did not get along with each other. In fact, there was real serious, serious, heavy drama that went on in this family. There was rape, there was homicide, there was aggravated assault, and there was human trafficking. All of them were church members, and they knew better, but their emotions ruled. Despite of everything that they did, deep down in each of their hearts, there was longing for happiness for a deeper fulfillment. I have a confession to make. Nahoku is not their real name. You know them better as the family of Jacob in Genesis chapter 29, 
to 38. You see, everybody's got problems. Everybody's got issues. Everybody's broken. Malcolm had his issues. But he's the guy, Malcolm was the guy who looked like he had no issues. He was the guy that looked like he had it all together. But you see, he was, he was an excellent and well-respected Bible teacher. He was a good speaker. And he was a high-ranking church officer. But you see, deep down in his heart was hidden pride. He had a lot of insecurity within. He actually cared a lot about what other people think of him, and yet privately he was critical of many others. The truth is, he was far from perfect himself. He knew a lot of truth intellectually, but it did not connect and convert the heart. Deep down inside, he knew what was right, but somehow he needed something deeper. He was looking within his heart for a deeper happiness, a deeper fulfillment. As you can guess, Malcolm was not his real name. Would you like to guess his real name? His real name is Nicodemus. Oh. You read his story in John chapter 3. You see, friends, everybody's got problems. Everybody has issues. Everybody's broken. Amen? How about you? What problems do you have? What are your issues? Are you emotionally broken in some form or fashion? And if there's anybody here who thinks they're not, you are in denial. And denial itself is an issue. Because everybody's got problems. Everybody's got issues. Everybody's broken. The question this morning that we're going to explore is how did we get like this in the first place? I mean, what lies at the root of our emotional um, brokenness and dysfunction? I mean, why in the world are we the way we are? And more importantly, how can we break out? Oh, uh, yes, I have a disciple right there. <laughs> she's, she's answered the altar call a little early. But how can we break out of this dysfunction and how can we heal? My friends, these are tough questions to answer. They are very, very tough. The reason they are very tough is because the one person you know the most, but yet understand the least, is who? Yourself. You see, we are complex and multifaceted beings. No, no one person has all the answers. But we can look at ourselves at different levels. If we picture ourselves as a tree, level one is our fruit. It is the actions and the behaviors that we all see. It's what is visible to each and every one of us. But we have to go beyond people's actions and behavior. Don't you agree? You, underlying those actions and behavior are thoughts and feelings. But we don't even understand or know our thoughts and our feelings. We, can, we, we feel them, we're thinking them, but we can't put a name on them. Are you with me? That's level number two, but this morning we're going to go deeper than level two. We're going to go to level three. Level three is the spiritual condition of man. This is the root of our problem. So today we're going to go down deep. We're going to go down root deep. We're not just going to go deep. We're going to go deep. Are you with me? Our deepest emotional need. If I were to ask you, what is your deepest, what is your single deepest emotional need? It is, as my friend Pastor Kayla would say, to love and to be loved. Isn't that true? Yes. Amen? 
Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. One more time. Amen? Amen. You're awake. Problem with this is that human love is imperfect. And it is a mixed bag. It is a mix of good and bad. Now, all of you who are married have told me that marriage is not a bed of roses. And I'm like, what? Really? Isn't marriage supposed to be the highest form of expression of love? It's when a man and a woman knock down all barriers between them and they become one flesh. Isn't this supposed to be what love is about? So why isn't it a bed of roses? In fact, from what I see and understand, marriage is a mix of joy and sadness, pleasure and pain, trust and distrust. It's a mixed bag. So the question is, why is that? What went wrong with human love and how did it become dysfunctional? Because obviously it's not functioning the way God intended it to. Are you with me? Because it is supposed to be a bed of roses. Amen. Amen? Amen. So this is where we're going to go deeper. Our starting point cannot be human beings. You see, there's a principle. It's called, by beholding, we become changed. If I am looking at human beings trying to solve my problem, I'm just going to reinforce that problem and become more like the human beings in the problem. Are you with me? Amen. If we are going to find the answers, we have to go beyond human beings, and we have to go to the starting point of all things. We have to go to the Bible and the God who created love in the first place. Amen? Amen. Amen. Are you ready to get into your Word? Amen. Are you ready to get into God's Word? Amen. Then open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. Verses 37 and 40. Matthew chapter what? 22. 22. We're going to look at verses 37 to 40. It is a very familiar verse to many of us. Matthew chapter 22. Verses 37 to 40. When you're there, say amen. Amen. Jesus said to him, well, let's back up, let's go to verse 36. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Verse 37, Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, I want us to look at this deeply because I'm going to illustrate it on the screen. What we're talking about here is God says, how many, how many commandments is he mentioning here? Two. 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 Right? Okay. The first is... Love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. This is the first commandment. God gives that law in order, in order to protect this vertical relationship between God and man. There's a relationship there. A relationship. And my friends, there is love in both directions. There is downward love from God to man. And there is to be upward love from man to God. When that happens, both are happy. Amen? Amen? Very simple. You read it in the Bible. Now, second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. That commandment protects the horizontal relationship between myself and others. And there is to be love that flows in both directions. There is outgoing love from myself to my neighbor. And then there is to be incoming love from my neighbor to me. As long as we follow these two commandments, everybody is happy. 
Are you with me so far? Let's put these two relationships together now. And you have this. You have the vertical and you have the horizontal. And what you're going to find is within the intersection of these two relationships, we find something very important. In the intersection and the space of these two relationships, we find our spiritual wellspring. Pastor, what's that? Well, our spiritual wellspring is where we find living water. You see, there are things that are necessary for you and me to be emotionally well. And what you find is we can only understand and feel these things in the context of love. Now when you have your wellspring boxed in by the four walls of love, love from God to me, love from me to God, love from me to others, and love from others to me, that creates a well in which we can find our spiritual and emotional well-being. And this well-being has four Components. How many? Four components. The first is when I am in this box of love created by God and the laws of God are in place, I understand my true self-worth. I understand what I am really worth. I understand my significance. When I am in this wellspring, there I understand how to value others correctly. There I truly understand what your value is, what your value is, why you are important, why you are important. There I understand my life purpose. What am I here for? What am I doing? What am I meant to be? And it is here in this wellspring that we find true happiness. It is there that I am complete, that I am emotionally whole. Amen. 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 I can only find that in the intersection of the horizontal and the vertical. Now, I want you to open your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 2. Verse 13, because we're going to see what happened to the spiritual wellspring. Guys, we are going to go very, very deep in this one verse. This one, this one verse is short, but it's super, super, super deep. Are you ready to get deep? Amen. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. Jeremiah 2. Verse 13. When you're there, say amen. amen. For my people have committed what? Two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of what? Living waters. And had hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. What does it mean to hew? Cut, dig out. In fact, I, I like the translation of the NIV better. I have it on the screen. My people have committed two sins. Sin number one, they have forsaken the spring of living water. Sin number two, they have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. We are now going to dig deep and study each of these pieces to understand what went wrong with human love. Now, I'm going to focus here on sin number one. They have forsaken me. Now, we all know about the sin rebellion. We all know how Lucifer wanted to be equal with God. He launched a rebellion against God, and then he came down to this earth, and he tempted mankind. Now, when mankind was tempted, let's look at the spiritual dynamic of what actually happened. I want us to look at the serpent's temptation to Eve. This is taking you back to the very beginning, Genesis. The devil said, when you eat from this fruit, your eyes will be open and you what? Will be like God. 
Essentially, what, he, what was happening here is he was saying, you, mankind, will rise up and be what? Equal with God. Are you with me so far? Now, the Bible continues in Romans chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. It says, they, mankind, exchange the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like what? Mortal, mortal human beings. In other words, we were created in the image of God, but after sin, man created God in his own image. And as you can see in Greek mythology and in other things, what do the gods look like? Human beings. Essentially what this is telling us is man in his mind pulled down God so that God is equal to man. Do you see the two things going on? Man is rising up, and God is being pulled down. So I'm going to put that on the screen. Here's that vertical relationship, right? God is up here, we are here. But yet somehow the creature was trying to put the Creator on equal level. Somehow this vertical relationship would move and become horizontal. Now watch the screen. It's moving and it's there. Man, through his sin, rose up, he pulled God down, and now the creature is equal with the Creator. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Look at it carefully, because this is where the problem starts. Amen. The creature becomes, sets himself to be equal with the Creator. The vertical becomes horizontal. <coughs> Now, remember this? Oh, well, let me ask this question. How did this affect our emotional well-being? What did this do to us? Well, remember this? Mm -hmm. Our wellspring where our happiness is? I want you to notice what happens when the vertical becomes horizontal. Keep an eye on that blue box. Because it's in that blue box that we have our self-worth, others' worth, our life purpose, and our happiness. Watch what happens to it when the creature becomes equal with the Creator. Are you ready? Are you ready? Yes. Keep your eyes on the screen. You might miss it. Are you ready? That's our happiness, the blue box. Watch what happens to it as the vertical turns horizontal. Did you catch it? You missed it. You missed it. You missed it. Let's do it again. That's our happiness. That's my happiness. That's your happiness. Watch what happens to it. As the vertical becomes horizontal. Our happiness was what it are you with me? Are you with me? Yeah. Was that deep? Thank you. That was super deep. <laughs> now, they have forsaken the spring of living water. When man forsake God, the living water was gone. Amen. Let's look at sin number two. Because man had turned God away, he now was left to his own devices. They have dug their own cisterns. What are cisterns? Vessels or water wells or tanks. They dug their own wellsprings. But the problem is, these are broken cisterns that cannot hold living water. Let's explore that more deeply. Let's go at this. They dug their own cisterns. Remember this? Self-worth, others' worth, life purpose, happiness. Now what you find is, when the vertical is gone, there's only two walls left. 
If you have water in a container that has four walls and you take out two walls, what happens to the water? It's gone. And what happens is you have the four components of the human composition left. But what do you do with them? The, the, what we have to do is now redefine them in terms of the horizontal because the vertical is now gone. Are you with me? Are you with me? We have to redefine. We have to dig and create our own systems. We have to redefine these concepts according to myself and to others because that is the horizontal relationship. So what you find is my self-worth, how I value myself, is now going to be based upon my performance and others' opinions of me. How I feel about myself depends on how well I perform. Did I do good? Did I do bad? If I do good, I feel good about myself. If I did bad, I feel horrible about myself. And then, oh, what are others thinking of me? Did, do you think I did good? Do you think I did bad? My friends, our worth becomes dependent on what we do and what you think. Do you care about what people think about you? Yeah. Do you care about your performance? When you do good, does it make you feel good? When you do bad, does it make you feel bad? My friends, our self-worth begins to be based on myself and others' opinions. I don't really think we understand how deep this goes. It's simple for me to put it on the screen, but I challenge you to analyze all aspects of your life. You are going to find this equation more than you think. How do you feel about yourself today? Are you influenced? by what others think of you? Do you care about your performance? Because after all, as broken human beings, that's how we value ourselves. More than that, that's how we value others. What you're worth to me is based upon your performance and what I think of you. It is easy. I do. I catch myself doing it all the time. I see somebody out on the street. I see them begging for money. And I'm, I'm thinking in my head, oh man, what is this guy doing? Well, we don't need, you know, bums like this on the street. His performance, down. What I think of him, down. But the truth is, is that what he's worth? The truth is, Jesus died for him too. Yeah. His worth is much more than I can ever imagine. Amen. My friends, what you're going to find later, we're going to explore this in the second sermon, but my self-worth is not based on my performance and others' opinions. It's based on Jesus' perfect performance and the permanent approval and opinion of my Father. Amen. It is because Jesus did everything right that I can be happy. It's because the Father said, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. He said that today of Mario and Yolanda. My friends, it is there upon Jesus' worth that we find our own self-worth. We're going to explore that deeper next time. But do you see how this works now? It's all on the horizontal. Let's go deeper. How do we now define our life purpose? Our life purpose was to glorify God. Our life purpose now is to make myself happy. Come on, everybody admit it. We don't want to say it, but deep down inside, that's our purpose. Make ourselves happy. Anybody going to be honest and say amen? amen? Now, it's make myself happy. How do I find happiness? I find happiness now in other people and other things.
Are you getting this? Let's, let's explore this deeper. Do you remember when we had the vertical going to the horizontal now? It was moving? Now God becomes equal with others. God becomes equal with people and with things. And because I'm turning to other people and things to make me happy, I am making other things and people my God. Are you with me? And there is where you have the start of idolatry. False gods. We do not understand this very well, but the truth is this. You and I, whether we accept it or not, we seek, we serve, and we worship false gods in the hopes and the expectations that these gods will bless us and bring us happiness. These are called, called idols. What are some idols that are popular? Do you serve the god of money? Who wants to be rich? I do! By the way, that's not bad. We'll talk about that more. But how much of us work and work and work and work and work and sacrifice our health, our family, everything else, our, our service to the Lord, our service to church, our service, because we need and want money. Amen. Amen. Because money brings me happiness. Amen. Maybe the idol we're serving is relationships, family and romantic relationships. If I only do what, what they want, if I only be what they want, then maybe, just maybe, they will bless me and make me happy. Amen. Even if they mistreat me, even if they do wrong to me, if, if I just do what pleases them, maybe, just maybe, I will be happy. Are you serving the God of fame and success? I will sacrifice my health on the altar so I can be successful. I will do whatever it takes to get to the top. Because if I do, success will bless me and I will be happy. Are you serving the God of ideals? What do I mean? All of us have ideals of what we want for our life. We have ideals of career, of spouse, of romantic partners, of church, of everything. And we have these ideals, and we think, if we only get these ideals, then somehow those ideals will bless me. If I worship these ideals, they will bless me and make me happy. Do you worship the God of physical health? Oh man, when I go to the gym, I see people doing it all the time. The God of the bicep. <laughs> they go there and they think. That, and you see people doing it all the time. They're in the gym with their phones taking selfies and putting it on Instagram and all of this stuff. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm sitting there, I'm over there trying to do one push-up and I'm struggling and I'm going, oh Lord help me. And I'm looking over there going, wow, they're worshiping the God of physical fitness. Because they think that if they look good, if they feel good, that God will bless them and they will be happy. Problem is we're serving idols and we don't even know it. You are serving idols this morning and you don't know it. I am serving idols this morning and I don't know it. And part of the problem is that sin piggybacks on good legitimate things. Is it wrong to have money and wealth and riches? No. Is it good to be physically fit? Yes. Is it good to want to eat good delicious food? Yes. Is it good to desire sexual relationships within marriage? Yes. All of these things are good. Is it good to be successful and have direction in life and a good career? Yes. The problem is, 
We turn to these things. We're looking for them to bless us and fill us and make us happy. But it doesn't work. Amen. Amen. The great reformer, John Calvin, great Protestant reformer, said, the human heart is an idol factory. In other words, you and I are constantly creating idols within our heart. Whatever you see on the horizontal plane, there's a tendency for us to turn them into idols. The question I have this morning for myself and for you, what idols has your heart manufactured? Do you want to be happy? Do you really want to be happy? Sure. My friends, trying to find these idols has to do with the next question. What things, what people, what ideals do you feel that if you just had them, or if you changed them, or if you had more or less of them, whatever it is, what is it that would make you happier? As you answer that question, it will help reveal the idols that are in your life. Because the truth is, God is the only source of happiness. Amen. 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 Is this deep? Jeremiah 2.13 My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me the spring of living water. Now we're going to look at deeper sin number two. They have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. In other words, they're broken because they're emotionally broken and it doesn't work to repair us. Let's take a look at this. Time has passed us, but are you allowing me to go yes. longer? Yes. Amen. Are you interested? Amen. Amen. Is this meat? Yes. I want us to look at the horizontal again. Second commandment. God's law says, love your neighbor as yourself. That puts me and my neighbor at equal level. Are you with me? There is balanced love between me and my neighbor. That is the law of God. Now, without the vertical relationship holding the horizontal relationship in place, the horizontal becomes unstable and imbalanced. What am I saying? If I had, um, if I had this, this is the horizontal, and there was nothing in the middle to hold it fixed, then, and I take away my hand, what happens to this? It falls, but it will also do this. Do you see it? Without the stability of the horizontal, or the vertical, the horizontal becomes unstable and unbalanced. Amen? Amen. This sounds all intellectual, but as you pray and let the Holy Spirit bring it deep into your heart, it's going to be like, aha, I get it. But here we go. We're going to look at how the horizontal became imbalanced and began to shift. And as a result, you and I became emotionally confused and we became emotionally broken. Are you ready? Amen. Are you ready? Amen. Paying attention now. What do you mean by imbalanced? Let's look at if the bar, if I go this way and others go this way. What is happening here? I'm, my, I'm lifting myself up and I'm putting others down. Do you see it? What happens here? You have an imbalanced love relationship now. What has happened is, I love myself and I begin to hate others. I overvalue myself by undervaluing others. When it says here hate, it does not mean that I like hate you. It means I love you less. 
Because in the Bible, when it says you must hate your mother, your father, your brother before you can become a disciple, Jesus is saying you don't hate them, hate them. You just love less. You love Jesus more. When this happens, when in my heart I overvalue myself and I value, undervalue others, what you begin to see is the sin forms. Because what is the definition of sin? Transgression, transgression of the law. Another word for transgression is deviate. When you deviate from God's law, you are committing sin. If God's law is like this, and you're like this, you're deviating from God's law. Are you with me? Amen. Amen. It's in the context of sin that you get the rise of emotional issues. It is when I overvalue myself that I have pride, pride and envy and seek to control. And simultaneously, I'm feeling towards others negativity. I'm blaming them for the problems. I'm being critical of them. And ultimately, I'm rejecting them. Do you see it? My friends, these are where you get into all the emotional problems and behavioral issues. I want you to notice, this is what happened with Satan. Satan wanted to be God, he had pride, and what did he do to God? He began to blame him, he began to criticize him, and ultimately he rejected him. When the devil tempted Eve, he, he said, you will be like God. He said, let yourself rise up, take that pride, envy God's position, and now take matters into your own hands, control the situation eat the fruit. And when they ate the fruit, Adam said, Adam and Eve, where are you? Did you eat of the fruit I told you not to? And what did Adam say? His famous line, it was the woman! Woman. I blame her! Others. And ultimately she says, I blame the serpent. They're criticizing ultimately who? God. And ultimately they are rejecting God. What we do to God is exactly what we do to each other. Today you have hidden pride. Today in your heart you are envious and seeking to control your own life. You don't know it, but you are. This morning you are blaming, criticizing, and rejecting people, and you don't know it. But yet this is where the heart of our dysfunction lies. Let's go the other way. Why, what if I go down and others go up? What happens then? Are you ready? What happens when I undervalue myself and overvalue others? When I undervalue myself, it's there that I begin to feel shame and fear. It is there that I am fearful of what others think of me. It is there that I have my deep-rooted insecurity. It is there that I have my self-doubt. It is the opposite of pride. And at the same time, I'm overvaluing other people's opinion. I'm seeking their approval. And I'm performing and doing things to please them. Why? Because I want their overvalue to make up for my undervalue. I am using them to fill me. Are you seeing it? Mm -hmm. I suspect this is where most of us will find ourselves. Do you have insecurities? Do you have self-doubt? Do you have fears of all kinds? <laughs> My friend, is it possible that the root of that is because our sin of undervaluing ourselves? Because we're digressing from the law of God. Are you with me? Yeah. Let's put it together. And you see a picture of human dysfunction. 
You see, Eve, Adam and Eve, the devil, they had pride, they envied God and the things they didn't have, they took control and had matters and took matters in their own hands. They went, they blamed God, they blamed each other, they criticized, and ultimately they rejected. But in doing that, notice, instead of going up, they actually brought themselves down. And what happened when Adam and Eve can, uh, was in front of God? Before they were naked and it wasn't a problem. And afterwards, they said, God, we hid from you. Why? We were afraid. Because we were naked. In trying to go up, they actually went down. And what you find there is the beginning of human insecurity. They took fig leaves and they tried to cover themselves. That is what you and I do today. We walk around with facades. Happy Sabbath, everybody! Deep down inside, we've got our hurts, our insecurities, and our fears. Are you with me? Amen. But not only that, we put on facades. Why? Because we care what other people think about us. Is it possible that we think all too much of what others' opinions are? We, we want the approval of those, especially those who, who love us, or we want to love us. Perhaps it's a father, it's a mother, it's a brother, a sister, a husband, a spouse, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, and you're saying, I want you to love me. And so you're going to perform. You're overvaluing them because you want them to fill your undervaluing of yourself. But when you don't get what you want, when your false god and your idol does not bless you and give you happiness, you turn around and you take a position of pride and you blame them and you criticize them and you reject them. Are you with me? Let's add more to the picture. When you feel that you're undervaluing yourself, when you are insecure in of yourself, and then you perceive that others are undervaluing you, they're not thinking favorably of you. You're not thinking favorably of yourself, they're not thinking favorably of you. Together, I and others undervalue me. And what happens when I don't feel good about myself, you don't feel good about me. I enter a world of pain, hurt, and ultimately anger. Amen? Amen. Am I speaking truth? Yes. But let's say the opposite happened. Let's say that I overvalued myself. Hey, <laughs> I'm the man. Okay, and then you overvalued me. You think I'm the man too. Then life is great, right? Because I'm the man in my own mind. I'm the man in your mind. And therefore, I'm happy, right? No. If you got everything you want, you will experience hollow happiness. You will be happy for a time, but just for a time. It will not fill you. And ultimately, it will plunge you back to the other side. How do we know that? King Solomon experienced it. King Solomon wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, and he said, I held nothing back. I got all the women I want, I got all the food I want, I got all the gold and riches I want, I got everything I want. But you read the opening lines of his book, and he says, vanity, vanities, meaningless, meaningless. It's all a chasing after the wind. He got what he wanted, he got what he wanted, but in the end it was hollow. My friends, this is the true picture of human dysfunction.
The issue is we are all born with this schema in our psyche already. It's all implanted from birth. This is the heritage we get from our forefathers, from Adam and Eve after they sinned. That schema, this schema, is in our heads already when you and I are born. And then we filter all life experiences through it. And what happens is the life experiences either reinforce it, okay, and we pass it on now to other generations and to other people around us. And it's because of this that hurt people end up hurting people. Are you with me? Yeah. <sighs> You're my church family, and I believe you love me. And so I want to be transparent with you for a moment. I want to tell you my story with this diagram. For much of my life, I have struggled with feelings of not being good enough. I've made it, I've mastered hiding it so that people don't see it or don't know it. But deep down inside, I'm here. And I knew growing up that there was something wrong. And as an adult, I had to seek Christian counseling and help to try and figure out where is this all coming from and what can I do. What I found out is I was asking myself, what am I doing? Because here, I was, tr I was, I was, I don't know, I just did not feel worthy. I did not feel like I measured up. I always felt like I had to prove something. In order to find where this was coming from, I had to look at the previous generation. I looked to my parents. And there I discovered that my dad came from a family where he was always made to feel less. And he did what he can to prove himself. In fact, coming to the United States was part of it. You know, people told him he could not be successful. People told him he could not be anything good. And so he came from the Philippines to America in search of the American dream. If he could strike it big, then he's worth something. Somehow that mentality got passed on to me. And I grew up under that mantle of, de of not feeling good enough and needing to prove myself. And then my life experiences reinforced this. At an early age, see my parents were poor immigrants from the Philippines. They came, moved to Philadelphia with no money in their pockets. They lived in the deep inner city in the ghetto because houses were very cheap. And there they set up their own business and I grew up in business. and. Those of you who know, I shop in Chinatown a lot, not, because, not just because it's cheap, but because it brings me back to my roots. When you see those young people behind those cash registers, that was me. I went to a school, I was in the deep inner city, I went to a school that was half black and half white. And guess who was the only Asian? I got constantly beat up by both sides. I kept a journal throughout this whole time. And today I thought about sharing it with you, but I decided not to. When I opened to the page of all that violence that has happened, there's a page where there was just so much violence in one day I couldn't write about it, so I just drew pictures. And I thought to myself, what is wrong with me that people should hate me so much? The, the white people were beating me up, the black people were beating me up. I was being beat up on both sides, and I wondered, what is wrong with me? Why am I like this? Doesn't anyone really care for me? Why, what's wrong with me that they don't want me? And so my dad said, you, you pursue the American dream, you study hard, you excel academically, you get rich and you get us out of poverty. Growing up in business, I made it my plan to become an international business tycoon. I wish I could show it to you. During the eighth grade, they asked us to write a little paragraph about what we wanted to be when we grew up. 
in my yearbook, if you were to look at the caption. Everybody else was like, yeah, I think I want to be, you know, this, 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 and this. I wrote in a little caption. I want to start an international network of malls that sell international food throughout the equatorial regions of the world. I'll have my sister be stationed in Asia, I have my other sister stationed in Europe, I will be here in North America, I will bridge the business and bring it together, I will be your next Bill Gates, in the in, not in the computer world. The insecurity drove me to study hard. I got into a school that was known for producing billionaires. In fact, people who, some people who had come out of that school who inspired me were Warren Buffett, and our current president of the United States, Donald Trump. And today, there was, there was a man in my graduating class who I did not know at the time, but today he's a well-known billionaire. His name is Elon Musk. My goal, what was driving me? What was driving me? It was the insecurity. What drove me to try and be successful? I wanted the praise of other people. I wanted the money and the wealth to make me worth something. And then when I finally got to that place, when I was positioning myself to become a very rich person, I began to take a position of pride, and I began to look down at other people who had not reached my level of success. What others had done to me, I now was doing to others. From here, I went here. From here, I went there. I was a mess. In the midst of all of this, God called me into ministry. He said, Eric, your motivations are all messed up. You think you're successful. You think you're getting something. The truth is, you know nothing. And in the midst of this, God took me out of my environment. He sent me all the way to the other side of the world, to the Philippines, to prepare for ministry. And after that, He sent me to an island called Manai, where I pastored for two years. The people were very different from me. They spoke another language. I still remember, got on a plane from Honolulu to this place called Lanai, and I knew I was in for something when the guy in front of me, in the plane, turned back to the guy diagonally across him. And he said, hey, bruh, so what you doing over there? And I was like, okay, <laughs> I'm in for something new. Went there, God humbled me. Moved me on to Kona, gave me a church of people who 95% of them did not speak English. They only spoke Spanish. And God said, if you love me, feed my sheep. If they can't speak your language, then minister to them in their language. I said, what? The Lord said, this is not about you. This is about me. Then he brought me here to Waipahu. Amen. I still remember. First day I walked in, Laima, who I didn't see for over 20 years in Philadelphia, greets me at the door. No hi, hello, just, hey, what are you doing here? <laughs> in Tagalog, right? Oh, I don't think I go on with So anyways, she comes from Philadelphia also. When I got here, those of you who were church leaders at the time know that I was tried by fire. God said, Eric, if you love me, feed my sheep. God said, Eric, this is not about you. It's about me. Today, I still struggle with this, but there's a difference. When you struggle with this, there's a difference when you do it with Jesus Amen. than when you do it without Him. Amen. Amen. Because today, I know that 
my self-worth. Today, I know that my happiness is found only in Jesus. Amen. 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 The journey continues. That was my story. So what's yours? Today, maybe you're feeling broken. In fact, you are broken. And at this time, I would, do, I would like to invite our pianist and our chorister to come up. Maybe this morning, the things you saw on the screen speak to you. Maybe this morning, you find yourself insecure. Maybe this morning, you have pride in your heart. Maybe this morning, you are seeking the approval of someone who doesn't really care for you. Maybe this morning, you are seeking a false god, the false god of money, hoping that that idol will bless you and bring you happiness. But today, you are understanding that the happiness there is only hope. But by my friends, there is hope. There is hope today. Because if you want to find true happiness, you must return to the cross. Our wellspring and our happiness lied in the intersection of a cross. It lied where the vertical met the horizontal. Today, if you want to return to that, you can do it through the cross of Jesus. Because there on the cross, the horizontal met the vertical. And there at the center of the cross is the heart of Jesus. And in the heart of Jesus, there is peace, there is happiness, there is joy that no emotion here on earth can compare to. In the heart of Jesus, you will find a difference. In the heart of Jesus, you will find yourself. And so perhaps this morning, you want to say, Lord, I recognize I'm a sinner, and I am broken, and I need your help, because I cannot fix myself. This morning, you are saying, Lord, I need you to fill me so that I will know what true peace and happiness is in your spirit. This morning, you want to say, Jesus, I want to surrender all. This morning, you want to say, all to Jesus, I surrender. All to him, I freely give. I will ever love and trust in his presence. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to be my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Is that your prayer this morning? If that's your prayer, can I invite you to please stand? We're going to sing the first verse of our song. And then I would like to ask us to pause. I'll put in a word and then we'll continue the song. Yeah. Hey. 
give us an opportunity to respond to today's message. Maybe this morning you are broken. Maybe this morning you have struggles in your heart. Maybe this morning you are trying to find your self-worth. Maybe this morning you know that you are not where you should be with God. But today God is calling you. Today the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart. Today you want to find peace. You want to find true happiness. If that is you, then I invite you as we sing to the rest of the song to please come forward so that we can pray together, that we can bring this together to the Lord, and that we can acknowledge our brokenness so that we can receive healing. If you would like to respond, I ask that you do so as we sing the rest of this song. for satisfaction. We search far and near for happiness, for fulfillment, but we find it not. And so this morning, Lord, we come before you. We come before the foot of your cross. And Lord, there where heaven meets earth, there in your heart, let us find the peace that we are so seeking for. Lord, give us this living water Lord, fill us so that we will no longer thirst. Help us, Lord, to submit everything. Lord, the, the idols are so rampant in our life, we can't even see them. So, Lord, we ask, reveal them to us so that they can be removed and that your spirit can take rightful place in our life. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, we are hurting people. We are full of pain. We are, we are suffering under the weight of, of our wrong decisions and our sinfulness. And Lord, we cannot cure ourselves. And so this morning, Lord, we bring all to the foot of your cross. And we plead with you, please, Jesus, save us from our sin. Save us from our dysfunction. Heal us, Lord. Change us into the people you want us to be. May we reflect the character of Jesus. Oh Lord, whatever pride may be within, whatever insecurity may be within, whatever seeking of approval may be within, whatever critical judgmentalism is within, whatever 
hurt and pain and hollow happiness that is within. Let it now be set at your cross to be crucified, to be destroyed, that we may resurrect in the newness of life. New Christians, Lord, who are happy in you and who can love our neighbor as ourselves. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, we just ask now, forgive us for our sin, cleanse us from all righteousness, and restore us now into right standing with you. We pray for your healing, both now and until the day of your return. In Jesus' name we pray.